Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Tuesday, July 14th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty, grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, to seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. O oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Our New Testament reading today is from Galatians chapter 3. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law, or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law? or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. To give an human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean, the law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make a promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that would give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And our Book of Concord reading tonight is from Part 3 of the Small Called Articles. Article 3 on the False Repentance of the Papists. And then tomorrow, in case I forget to tell you, 
tomorrow's Book of Concord reading will be from still in section three, and we will hear about the Gospel, baptism, the Lord's Supper, the Office of the Keys, and confession. And then we'll be getting close to done with the small cult articles. They're fairly short. But tonight we'll hear about the false repentance of the papists. It was impossible for them to teach correctly about repentance since they did not know what sin really is. As has been shown above, they do not believe correctly about original sin. Rather, they say that the natural powers of human beings have remained unimpaired and uncorru uncorrupted. They believe that reason can teach correctly so that the will can do what is right, and God certainly bestows his grace when a person does as much as he can according to his free will. According to that dogma, they need to do penance only for actual sins. Those would include only the evil thoughts that a person yields to, or evil words and evil deeds that free will could easily have prevented. According to these people, wicked emotions, lust, and improper attitudes are not sins. They divide repentance into three parts, contrition, confession, and satisfaction. They add this consolation and promise, if a person truly confesses and renders satisfaction, he merits forgiveness. He has paid for his sins before God, so even in repentance they taught people to put confidence in their own works. This is where the expression comes from that was used in the pulpit when public absolution was announced to the people. Prolong, O God, my life until I can make satisfaction for my sins and amend my life. There was here no mention of Christ and faith. People hoped to overcome and blot out sins before God by their own works. With this intention, we become priests and monks so we could protect ourselves against sin. As for contrition, this is how it was done. No one could remember all his sins, especially those committed over an entire year. So they inserted this provision. If an unknown sin is remembered later, it too has to be repented of and confessed and so on. Until then, the person was commended to God's grace. Furthermore, since no one could know how great the contrition ought to be, in order to be enough before God, they gave this consolation. He who could not have contrition at least ought to have attrition. I call that half a contrition or the beginning of contrition. The fact is, they themselves do not understand either of these terms any more than I do. But such attrition was counted as contrition when a person went to confession. If anyone said that he could not have contrition or lament his sins, as might be the case with illicit love or the desire for revenge, etc., they asked whether he wished or desired to have contrition. When one would reply yes, for who save the devil himself would say no, they accepted this as contrition. They forgave him his sins on account of this good work of his. Here they cited the example of St. Bernard and others. Here one sees how blind reason gropes about in matters belonging to God, 1 Corinthians 2.14. According to its own imagination, re reason seeks consolation in its own works and cannot remember Christ in faith. Viewed in the light, this contrition is a manufactured and fictitious thought. It comes from our own powers, without faith and without the knowledge of Christ. When he reflected on his own lust and desire for revenge, the poor sinner might have laughed rather than wept, unless he had either been truly stuck by the, struck by the lightning of the law, Psalm 77, 18, or had been tormented by the devil with a sorrowful spirit, 1 Samuel 16, 14. With everyone else, such contrition was certainly mere hypocrisy, and did not put to death the lust for sins. They had to grieve, but if they were free, they would rather have kept on sinning. As for confession, the procedure was this. Everyone had to list all his sins, which is impossible. This was a great torment. If anyone had forgotten some sins, he would be absolved on the condition that, if they would occur to him, he must still confess them. So he could never know whether he had made a sufficiently pure confession, or if confessing would ever come to an end. Yet he was pointed to his own works. He was comforted like this. The more fully you confess, and the more you humiliate yourself and debase yourself before the priest, the sooner and better you render satisfaction for your sins. Such humility would certainly earn grace before God. Here, too, there was neither faith nor Christ. The power of the absolution was not declared to him, 
Rather, his consolation depended upon his listing of sins and his self-abasement. What torture, fraud, and idolatry this kind of confession has produced is more than can be said. As for satisfaction, this is by far the most complex part of all. For if no one can know how much to render for a single sin, yet alone how much for all, they resorted to the device of imposing a small satisfaction, which could indeed be rendered, as five our fathers a day's fasting or such, then for the rest of their repentance, here they were directed to purgatory. Here, too, there was nothing but anguish and misery. Some thought they would never get out of purgatory. According to the old church laws, seven years' penance in purgatory is required for a single mortal sin. Yet confidence was placed in our work of satisfaction. If the satisfaction could be perfect, confidence would be placed in it entirely. Neither faith nor Christ would be necessary, but such confidence was impossible. For even though someone had done penance that way for a hundred years, he would still not know whether he had finished his penance. This meant doing penance forever and never coming to repentance. Then the Holy See at Rome, coming to the aid of the poor church, invented indulgences. With these, it forgot, it forgave and remitted satisfaction. First, for a single sin, an indulgence could cancel seven years in purgatory. Or an indulgence could cancel a hundred years. They distributed them among the cardinals and bishops, so that one could grant indulgences for a hundred years and another for a hundred days. But the Pope received to himself alone the power to cancel the entire satisfaction. Since indulgences began to yield money and as much traffic in bulls became profitable, the Pope devised the Golden Jubilee Year, a truly gold-bearing year, and established it at Rome, uh, for comparison compared to Leviticus 25. He said this would give the cancellation of all punishment and guilt. The people came running because everyone would gladly be freed from this grievous, unbearable burden. This was meant to find and raise the treasures of the earth. Immediately, the Pope pressed still further and multiplied the golden years one after another. The more he devoured money, the bigger his appetite grew. Later, by his representatives to the countries, the Pope issued his golden years everywhere until all churches and houses were full of the golden year. Ultimately, he made an inroad into purgatory among the dead. First, he founded masses and vigils, and afterward indulgences in the golden year. Finally, souls became so cheap that he released one for a penny. But all this, too, did nothing. Even though the Pope taught people to depend on and trust these indulgences for salvation, he made the matter uncertain again. In his bulls, he declares that whoever wants to share in the indulgences or a golden year has to be contrite and have confessed and pay money. We have already seen how, with the papacy, contrition and confession are uncertain and hypocritical. Besides, no one knew what soul was in purgatory. If some souls were in purgatory, no one knew who had properly repented and confessed. So the Pope took the precious money, comforting people with his power and indulgence, but then he directed them again to their uncertain works. Now, some did not believe themselves guilty of actual sins in thought, word, and deed. I and the people like me in monasteries and religious communities wanted to be monks and priests. We fought against evil thoughts by doing such things as fasting, staying awake, praying, saying Mass, wearing coarse garments, and sleeping on hard beds. In total sincerity, and with great effort, we wanted to be holy. And we'll stop there tonight, because there's quite a bit more. Didn't think it would take that long to read, but that's a little much. So we will finish on uh, the false repentance of the Papists tomorrow evening. And now we join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we praise your fathomless mercy, with which you take pity on sinful men. All the prophets and apostles preach this to us in your holy word. Let our hope not be put to shame when we pray to you for all who suffer at this time. For behold, the evil foe has become mighty, and the great ones of this world rule often in unrighteousness. O God, who in former times caused your saints to overcome injustice, strengthen also today all who stand in need of your help. Grant that all prisoners of war held as slaves and sacrifices of earthly wrath may return to their home. Stand by all refugees and homeless people and be their justice. Be a father to the widows and orphans with your strong protection. Go through bars and fences to those who are imprisoned for the sake of your name. Strengthen them for a good witness and let them not waver in the confession of your name. Teach us through their example and the example of so many holy martyrs to be ever watchful of the confession of your son's name. Let us not be put to shame when the evil foe lays his hand on us. But if, if it is your will that we be persecuted for confessing Jesus as our Lord and only Savior, then support us in your grace, that we may withstand all trials, and grant us peaceful rest. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty and merciful God, by your gift alone, your faithful people render true and laudable service. Help us steadfastly to live in this life according to your promises, and finally attain your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.